All right, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining. I think we'll get started. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Perfect. Thanks, Sid. Um, so for those who I haven't met on the call, um, I'm Shane Freeman, one of the fourth year emergency medicine residents here at Western. Uh, also one of the acute care POCUS fellows through the Western SONO program here at, uh, in London. And we're going to be talking today POCUS and cardiac arrest. And we're going to spend a small amount of time also on the peri-arrest state as hypotension, but mostly in the intra-arrest and immediate post-arrest phase, because I think that's where the most, uh, most evidence and interest is. My supervisor for these rounds was Dr. Rasad Asani, who unfortunately couldn't join us here today, but nonetheless wanted to thank him for his support. And I think um, looking back at slides last night, one of the takeaways that I think the common theme we're going to see is maybe we should be doing more of things with ultrasound that we're not currently doing and less of things that uh, we're currently doing. And we'll talk through that as we go. So right off the front, no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest to declare. And probably one of the most important take home messages is all the images you're gonna see in today's presentation are from local exams, whether that be in the eMERGE with the ICU group, the medicine group. And really the point I'm trying to make is pathology is out there when you look for it. And the only way we're gonna do that is putting the ultrasound on people and try to find them. Um, without that, obviously we're not gonna find the pathology. So with that in mind, we're gonna jump right into a case off the front. So you get a patch that a 67 year old gentleman is coming in BSA. And when EMS arrives with the patient, they say, call for shortness of breath over the uh, preceding 12 hours. CPR is ongoing and defibrillator pads are placed and you see this rhythm on the monitor. And now thankfully your team is well staffed and you have someone well versed in using ultrasound in the arrest setting and ready to go and take a look at the heart during the first pulse check. And this is the view that you see. So why don't we go to is Rob Soaptrope. Rob, why don't you say, tell me what you're seeing uh, and what's your next step? So that looks like a fine BFib to me. So I would probably just shock that and continue ACLS. Awesome. Good. So this is, Rob's exactly right. With one defibrillation, you get ROSC because this is fine ventricular fibrillation as opposed to true asystole. And this is going to be one of the things we're going to talk about in the next hour, but just highlights one of the possible uses of ultrasound in the arrest setting. So things we're hoping to uh, check off the list today. So identifying the cause of arrest, and we'll talk a little bit about etiologies and pitfalls with that. Potential management change that can be made with POCUS, some prognostication things, uh, and how ultrasound can help you make that decision, how to improve your pulse checks, and then some future directions. So let's start with the guidelines and resuscitation to try to frame where POCUS should or shouldn't be used. And the guidelines I'm referencing are the 2020 AHA guidelines, which just came out obviously last year. And they're the newest kind of up-to-date recess guidelines. And basically what they say is if you have an ultrasound and you have an operator and you can stay out of the way of everything else, maybe go ahead and take a look. And then they conclude this based on weak level of evidence. So really not helpful on the initial thing. And they go on to say that well, maybe you can help figure out if this is cardiac tamponade or another reversible cause of arrest, or maybe you see some cardiac activity. And then they cite two papers, one, which we're going to talk a little bit about because it's garnered a lot of attention and controversy over delays in chest compressions with POCUS. And then the second one is an RCT that really found no difference when we use ultrasound during cardiac arrest. So for comparison's sake, from the same 2020 AJ guidelines, these three topics, that is precordial thump, fish or, fist or percussion pacing, and cough CPR are talked about as in much detail or more in these guidelines as ultrasound is. And I'll save you the, the actual reading of the 267 page document because it is quite dense, but they do cite the same level of evidence for all three of these things as ultrasound, which was kind of crazy to me. So I think where that kind of leaves us is we need to look elsewhere for some guidance because the guidance just isn't there in the AHA guidelines. So moving right along, let's get into searching for a cause of arrest. And this is probably the most common reason people pick up the ultrasound in the arrest setting is to see if they can find a cause. And what the literature is gonna tell us is about 15 to 30% of the time, yeah, maybe we can find a cause in ultrasound. So let's say you get a gentleman in, in cardiac arrest and it's a shock rhythm and you shock and you get ROSC and somebody puts the ultrasound in the sub xiphoid area and you get this very representative image in the recess bay. What are we looking at? And is there anything that we need to immediately do something about? Let's go to Steph Chilton. Um, so like you said, it's a sub-xiphoid. 
um, and then you can see some fluid in the in the near field. As far as I can tell, there's no actual fluid within the pericardial um, sac, but I'd want to have a look on some of her or his peristernal views um, to confirm that. And then I don't think I'd be jumping to, to doing anything just yet. Perfect. Totally agree. And I think that's a very fair answer in a lot of cases is I need to get more views. And especially now we have ROSC and a stable patient, we need some more information. So what we're talking here is pericardial effusion. And we'll come back to that image in a second to kind of dissect it. But the clinical question we're asking is, is this tamponade? And in general, we don't acutely care about pericardial fluid in the absence of something causing tamponade. And really when we're talking tamponade, that's a function of two things. One being the amount of fluid and two being the rate of accumulation. So think about certain pathologic states, things like dialysis, for example, where you have this sizable pericardial fusion that's just kind of slowly accumulating over time and the pericardium can stretch to accommodate that. So you don't get hemodynamic collapse as a result of that versus something like a stab wound to the chest where even a, like a small volume of fluid with rapid accumulation will lead to imminent cardiovascular collapse. And that's very different clinical scenarios despite a very different amount of fluid. And obviously what we talk about from a therapeutic implication is pericardiocentesis versus OR in the recess setting. And again, that depends on cause, blood versus other cause. Um, but nonetheless, that's kind of the, the imminent reversal we're looking for in the recess room. And now getting back to that image or any pericardial fusion you think you're seeing, there's a couple questions to ask yourself to determine, is this something that needs intervention or what am I actually looking at? And in the first two questions here, we're gonna address kind of a cause of arrest. So that is acute or chronic. And that can be difficult to tell if you don't have previous imaging to say one way or the other. And maybe you put that into the clinical context a little bit as well. For example, a dialysis patient, what may be. And if it is chronic, then is this now the culprit lesion or is this kind of a red herring? And we do know that people with chronic large effusions, a certain percentage will go on to develop tamponade in the first six months. So that is possible if it is chronic, it is now causing a problem as well. But then if you're through those questions, you get to the second two, which is talking about the mimics of pericardial fusion. And the, probably the biggest one we see is pericardial fat pad. And I'm sure we've all seen this, which is that gray mixed echo density uh, layer that sits on top of the RV usually. And the way you tell is it kind of has that mixed echo density and it moves with the heart as it's pumping. And then secondly, of course, is the final question relevant to this image is, are we actually seeing pericardial fluid or not? And Steph very, uh, very accurately picked up that this isn't pericardial fluid here. And if you take a quick glance, you might be convinced that this is pericardial fluid, this is tamponade, we need to tap this because it's this at a rest setting. But you have ROSC, take a minute to think through the image and then go through your diagnostic clues to try to figure that out. The two diagnostic clues you kind of want to touch on for pericardial fusion, again, one of the more common false findings we see is that ascites sitting in the near field. And if you see that hyperechoic band here, which is laid here, it's called the falciform ligament, which we all know is part of the liver, but it's not something we're used to seeing on echo. And if you see that, that's kind of the echo hallmark of ascites rather than pericardial fluid. And the final point for pericardial fluid that I want to make is the IBC. And I think pretty much everyone who I've talked to about ultrasound knows I'm not a fan and thoroughly dislike the IBC for various reasons because it has mostly its own problems. However, this is the one clinical indication I would say where it's key. And that's because the IBC itself has about a 97% sensitivity for telling whether this is tamponade or not. And what I mean by that is you can see in this image, as the patient breathes in, there's respiratory collapse. It's not plump, huge, thick. Those two things alone make this very unlikely to be tamponade, except for the rare uh, odd situation that we don't deal with in the eMERGE typically. But if you see a pericardial effusion, what you think is a pericardial effusion, next move is take a look at the IBC, and that's going to help you take tamponade off the table or say, hey, this still could be tamponade from there. So let's move right along to RV dilatation or enlargement. And perhaps there's no more clang association in the POCUS world than dilated RV equals PE until proven otherwise. And it's important to remember, however, you can get RV dilatation for a number of reasons. And we generally classify those reasons to two big categories. One being pressure overload, so things like PE, but the other one being volume overload. So things like valvular regurgitation or dialysis states, dialysis states, sorry, chronic volume overload, things like that. And of course, the therapeutic implication of this is thrombolysis if you think this is RV dilatation on the, on the context of PE. However, like pericardial effusion, and probably even more so, there's lots of caveats to this that we're going to talk about. So the first one to keep in mind is, is what we're seeing accurate. And 
could this be a weird axis or weird rotation that's making the RV look bigger than the LV when it's really just cutting the heart in an odd direction? And if it is big and you confirmed it's big, is that acute or chronic? Now in this image, there's a couple things that you can point out that would make this suggest this is not acute. And one of those is the, probably the biggest thing on the screen is the right atrium, which tends not to dilate acutely. And that makes this extremely unlikely to be acute. They classically, they talk about in the literature is searching for the RV wall on subxiphoid and measuring the thickness, but nobody has time to do that in a recess. So when you think about it, put it in the clinical context, is this a good reason for acute or chronic, or is this somebody with end stage COPD and pulmonary hypertension that has a good reason to have a dilated RV at baseline? So if you go through those and you think it's acute, then of course, this P is PE the cause, or could there be another cause of acute RV dilatation? Things like ARDS or bad pneumonia or anything like that. And then Probably the most important caveat is this the post arrest state, because if that's the case, then all bets are off the table in terms of RV dilatation, which is one of the things I referenced that things we're doing now that we probably shouldn't be doing. So let's talk first the case of off axis imaging. So on screen left, you see we have a basically an apical view, the probes at the tip of the heart, and you have both the left ventricle here and right ventricle in view. You have both mitral valve and tricuspid valve in view. And although it's a little slant in this image, you can see both mitral and tricuspid valve opening here. Now, if we just spin the probe, so instead of your probe marking a little bump on the side of the probe pointing at the right spot, you spin it a couple degrees around. And all of a sudden you're cutting weirdly through the LV and weirdly through the RV, where you have a little bit of mitral valve, you don't have a tricuspid valve anymore. And what this means is we're kind of looking at some oblong shape through the heart, and we don't really know one size relative to the other. So what I would caution is be very careful in making calls of large or normal size if you're not seeing both of those valves at once in the apical views. But let's talk post arrest state because say a patient came in post PE arrest, ROSC is achieved and you get an echo and you think the RV is big. Now, again, does that big RV equate to PE? And what the evidence would tell us is within minutes of cardiac arrest, the RV will dilate regardless of the cause of arrest based on this mechanism that this paper kind of laid out, which is during arrest, there's this high pressure left side systemic uh, circuit, and then the low pressure high capacitance right side. And what happens during the arrest is the blood just kind of follows that pressure gradient, falls down from the left to the right, and the right side dilates in response. And in, in animal models, it only took one minute of untreated VF for the RV to increase in size by about 30%. And that enough will make it look as big or if not bigger than the LV on its own. So when you get that post-arrest RV, we have to seriously question if we're just seeing post-arrest findings or is that actually the basis? But does this hold up in humans? And we see that it actually does. So what they did with this study was 59 patients with an echo within 24 hours of their cardiac arrest. And it's important to note that they had arrest for a number of different reasons. So about 40% were shockable, 30% were hypoxic, and then 32 fell into this circulatory arrest, which included some patients with PE themselves. And across the whole patient population, they saw abnormal RV size in 97% with bad function in 88. And that important takeaway is that was independent of the cause of arrest. So what I'm trying to get at here is in the arrest state, the RV dilates. That's an intra arrest finding that happens regardless of why they arrest. And it's not reliable to make a call of a large RV as a PE immediately following ROSC. So from now on, if you get a post-arrest state and you have these, you have say two patients who come in with these two respective images, I think we put less emphasis on just finding the RV dilatation itself as an indication of PE, because that one image on the left could just be somebody who arrested from VF and had untreated time of 30 seconds to a minute versus finding things like on the right, which is more conclusive of probable PE. So from now on, maybe we should be looking for other signs of PE or a clinical context that fits before pulling the trigger on that thrombolysis because a dilated RV in and of itself is not reliable. So let's move on to a couple of the etiology before we get into the rest of the talk, which is correcting the rhythm interpretation. So we'll bounce back to that case that Rob X really managed at the front. And now both of these images may present with that rhythm strip you see on the bottom of the screen. However, it's important because both these ultrasound clips show a much different rhythm and will highly likely result in a very different outcome for the patient. And what I mean by that is on screen left, it's hard, it might be hard to appreciate in a short video clip here, but everything is still, the blood, the valves, the myocardium, this is true cardiac standstill or asystole. 
versus the one on the right, which is the one we looked at earlier, where there's almost a twitch or kind of uh, fibrillating activity to the heart. And that again is fine ventricular fibrillation. Both of these can be seen in an asystolic rhythm. When it comes to fine ventricular fibrillation, we'll kind of talk about this more later, but it's more classically described in the transesophageal echo literature. However, it can obviously be seen on subxiphoid and transthoracic as well. Now, when non-shockable become shockable, I think if everyone had to pick an arrest a rhythm to arrest it into themselves, you're picking shockable every time. And I think the evidence would support you on that. As you can see the difference in odds ratio in terms of survival for a shockable rhythm up to as high as 20 likelihood ratio, 20 odds ratio, uh, down to as 0.1 for a non-shockable rhythm. So taking asystole into a shockable rhythm in the recess room would be a complete game changer. So it might be something worth considering if you're stuck in an asystolic rhythm that doesn't really make sense. Somebody went from VF to asystole right away, maybe take a look for that. The question then becomes, how often is asystole actually shockable? And what we don't necessarily have a good idea yet is how often that actually happens. And most of the literature that's out there kind of just talked case report wise where they thought it was asystole on the monitor, put the probe on and found fine ventricular fibrillation. However, just combing through some of our local studies here for this presentation, I've actually found multiple instances where a fine V-fib was readily seen on the ultrasound. And that's not necessarily just transesophageal echo, that can be transthoracic as well. So what, we say, what I'm getting at is we don't know how often this actually happens, but there is this one study that does raise some questions from 1984. And obviously with 1984 and, and methods there, think lots of things could have changed, we don't really know. But what they did was take 119 asystole patients and defibrillated them all pre-hospital. And what happened was about 8.4 or 10 of those patients had immediate change in their rhythm. And out of the 10 that had a change in the rhythm, six made it to hospital with a pulse and a rhythm, which is a bit odd and it does raise some questions. And like I said, obviously there's lots of confounding variables to this literature and we can't necessarily extrapolate that to make a call on how often this happens, but it certainly does raise some questions. So what does this actually look like? And this is a transesophageal echo view from just probably a month or two ago here. So this is ventricular fibrillation. You can see the heart muscle kind of fibrillating as you go. You can see the blood stagnant between the left atrium and left ventricle. They resume CPR while they're charging their defibrillation and they're gonna to work towards a shock here. And there's the shock delivered. And just like ACLS dictates, they pick up back up with CPR right away. So that's, that can be the finding that makes a game-changing diagnosis for you. Now, again, V-fib or fine V-fib on echo has trash, traditionally been described as a transesophageal echo finding at arrest, but you can see it on transthoracic or subxiphoid imaging as well. And what, this might be one of the potential benefits of transesophageal echo though, is this small study who looked at out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in the emergency department, they found out of their 33 patients, 12% who were believed to be an asystole based on the monitor actually had fine ventricular fibrillation fine ventricular fibrillation uh, in that rhythm. So again, worth noting that even if the transesophageal probe isn't in, might be worth taking a, a gander at the heart, whether at least subxiphoid or parasternal, in patients who, who this story doesn't really make sense. If you're stuck in asystole or you just went right from a shock rhythm into asystole, it doesn't really make sense, maybe take a look because that might be something you can, you can intervene on. And of course, no focus is talk is going to be in, uh, complete if we don't touch on these two etiologies. And we're not going to focus on this today, but in the right clinical scenario, all the other focus uses can come in handy too. So things like intra-abdominal hemorrhage and rupture AAA. And again, the, the important piece there is when the clinical context fits, take a look for those things. So let's jump along right into does POCUS change management? Because obviously that's something we ask every time we're making interventions or recommendation or something is does management change as a result? And all the studies would show a cause of arrest in and of itself can be found in something like 15 to 30% of the time. But when you factor in things like metabolic derangements like hyperkalemia or hypoxic arrest, which aren't gonna be seen on ultrasound, that probably accounts for that other 60 to 70% that we're not catching on ultrasound. So there are many protocols out there for this arrest and peri-arrest setting. And think of this as a similar approach to when you're reading chest x-rays or ECGs as a med student, the protocol is reinforced so that things are overlooked or missed. And now that works super well in a non-time critical, non-resuscitation setting, but given how comprehensive these protocols are, they may, that in itself may limit their utility. 
So think of it as designing a study to look at how often we find a proximal humeral bone lesion on chest x-rays order for shortness of breath. And if you looked at a study that said, we're gonna order chest x-rays on some people and not others and see if we find a difference between who has proximal humeral bone lesions, you probably wouldn't find a difference either because it's a rare finding. But what I'm getting at is all these protocols are quite lengthy, cumbersome and extremely difficult to apply in a rest and peri-arrest setting. But let's take a look at one of them, for example, which is one of the more popular ones called the shock ed protocol. And it's from a group of uh, researchers in POCUS out east in Canada. And basically the protocol itself, which is kind of laid out on the right there, involves at least 13 views in and of itself. And this is meant to be used in the undifferentiated hypotension patient to try to find a cause. And when they applied this in RCT, surprise, surprise, they didn't find a difference in terms of possible discharge or 30-day mortality. And there's also no difference in other imaging use, ICU admission, inotropic administration, fluid use, anything to that extent. So what I'm getting at is if we apply these protocols that are long to all patients, we're probably not gonna find a difference or at least in a study of 250 patients. However, again, if somebody came in stabbed in the neck and you're searching for a cause for their hypotension by starting with a fast in the pelvis looking for free fluid, you likely wouldn't have a mortality benefit either. So what if we took a more focused approach to ultrasound and cardiac arrest? Does that make a difference? Well, it turns out when they look at that in this study, that's exactly what they did was focus on the heart where they think they can make a difference in this life support or resuscitation setting. And what they used was two groups pre-hospital, one with ongoing CPR and the other with a resuscitation state, so severe hypotension or decreased LOC. And while being a fairly small study, the question that they're asking was, A, how often can we get quality images? And B, does that actually change our management? Well, what they see, the first point to take away is something we already know, that if this is feasible. We know we can get quality images. And for them, it was 96% of their patients had interpretable images. But when it came to a management change, when they surveyed the operators of the, uh, at the operators in the resuscitation house, they found that the cardiac arrest group had about 90% change in management. And the recess group had about a 67% change in management in that regard. Now, again, self-report subject to all its own biases, but the two areas they kind of highlighted is the areas that if they didn't use ultrasound, they wouldn't be able to find at all. That is cardiac tamponade and this concept of pseudo PEA, which we're gonna talk about a lot in this talk. Briefly, the pseudo PEA kind of topic, what they're diving into is they classify people as their rhythm on the monitor, whether that was suspected PEA or suspected asystole. And then they put the ultrasound on. And what they found was that almost 75% of patients with PEA on the monitor and 35 of those in asystole had some form of cardiac activity on ultrasound, which was definitely more than they were expecting. The question then becomes, does that hold up to a difference in hospital admission? And particularly when you look at the PEA group, there seemed to be some kind of association with hospital survival. So if you had PEA on the monitor, you had cardiac activity on ultrasound, about 55% of those got to the hospital in some way versus only 8% without cardiac activity. So there seems to be some signal there. But again, let's focus on the relatively uncommon findings that when found could make a big difference to the recess. So the things that we cause, would cause a typical or a typical ACLS to be deviated from. So your typical pulse check CPR defibrillation, if we found these other things that would cause you to deviate away from that. So things like pericardial effusion or suspected PE. And in a large study that included Canadian centers with almost a thousand patients, when these ACLS deviations were found and intervened on, the survival rate for, for example, pericardial effusion was 15.4%, or when they saw a visible clot and gave thrombolysis, 6.7% survival. If we compare that to the overall survival in this group, which is down at 1.6%, there's a big difference there. So I think the key though, is doing the ultrasounds the only way we're gonna find these ACLS deviations. And these findings will only likely be found in a small percentage of patients. So we're gonna end up seeing a lot of what we call so-called negative studies when we take a look. However, if you don't do the ultrasound, we're not gonna find the patients that could have had these uh, deviations that allow for improved outcomes. So we know POCUS may change management, particularly when these ACLS deviations are found, but can we change CPR outcome? And now what this slide shows is two views of transesophageal echo, but with CPR and progress in both, but a big difference. And what that difference is is where the compression is actually going. So on screen left, you can see that CPR is in the correct position. It goes right through the RV, which is being squished in here into the LV. This is the left atrium up here. And this 
small hypoechoic area here is actually the aorta flowing out from the heart. So this is properly placed compressions. In this screen right, you also see CPR being done, but the RV is down here, not really being compressed at all. It's going through the aorta into the left atrium and the left ventricle is really not changing size at all. This, you, this one usually happens from people doing too high up on the chest or too close to the head when they're doing compressions. And now the caveat with all of this is we don't really know how CPR works. There's two kind of competing models. There's this direct LV compression model, and then there's the intrathoracic pump model where you kind of just wrap in it, rapidly alternate intrathoracic pressure, and that's like blood on its own. But both could be possible. But because now we have the ability to monitor CPR in real time with transesophageal echo, this has become a question. So a small study of Italy has looked at this, and this, this is recent and kind of really garnered interest in this in the literature. But basically what they took was 19 patients who came into hospital with an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest for consideration of ECMO. And when they put these patients on ECMO, all 19 of them, seven of them had ROSC or what they call REMA, which is essentially just return of some kind of mechanical activity of the heart when they were on ECMO. And when they broke that down, of the seven patients on ECMO who got ROSC or REMA, all seven of those patients had compressions directed over the LV, compared to only one of 12 in the non-ROSC, non-REMA group. So that means the 11 of the 12 patients who didn't get ROSC or REMA had their compressions over the LVOT, which is the outflow track here, which is that, first, that second clip we were looking for with the compressions going to the left atrium. So again, this is maybe early evidence potential benefit of POCUS guided compressions, but again, it makes biologic sense that you wouldn't want to compress the aorta and cut off blood flow exit in the heart if that's what you're trying to do. So again, we don't know for sure, but certainly early evidence and something that we're gonna to have to watch down the road. So let's put a signpost here and kind of summarize what we talked about in terms of change management. So the all encompassing algorithms probably have limited utility. If we take a focused approach to reversible cause, so things like pericardial effusion, clot and transit, there's probably a survival benefit to come along with those. And if we focus on that high yield etiology in each context, there's probably even more benefit to be had rather than applying the all encompassing algorithm. Perhaps in the near future, we're gonna see POCUS guided compressions is possibly a outcome difference. And this talk of pseudo PEA or pseudo asystole, that is people who have that on the monitor, but they have cardiac activity on ultrasound, does that make a difference? And that's gonna kind of take us into our next section is prognostication, especially this pseudo PEA talk. So let's jump right into that. So one of the more, we're kind of going off the course here, but one of the more common talked about themes in emergency medicine and trauma is this emergency department thoracotomy or resuscitative thoracotomy. And the reason I bring this up is because there's this 2015 paper in the trauma population, which has formed the basis of their guidelines for thoracotomies. And essentially what they show was that if there was no cardiac motion and no cardi or no pericardial effusion, there were no survivors of thoracotomy. And that has essentially become the guideline now. So if no cardiac activity, no pericardial effusion, no thoracotomy is indicated. But this raises the question, if they can set a hard and fast guideline based on that for who's gonna survive and who needs a thoracotomy, can we apply this to the non-traumatic arrest as well to prognosticate? And it turns out this has been looked at quite extensively, even ahead of that 2015 trauma patient paper. And this systematic review from Canadian authors, again, out east, uh, was in 2012. And basically what they concluded that cardiac activity itself has some reasonable sensitivity and specificity for predicting who's gonna survive from cardiac arrest. What they go on to find is 2.4% of those without cardiac activity on echo go on to have ROSC. And what they conclude is that no cardiac activity lowers the likelihood of ROSC, but it's not a hard and fast zero like it is in the trauma population. That's likely probably coming from the fact that medical arrests are a bit more heterogeneous and involve things like hyperkalemia that if you dealt with and you can shift the potassium, you may effectively allow the heart to regain function versus a blunt myocardial injury from a, a blunt MVC, for example, that would be a profound devastating injury enough to cause standstill. There's probably no survival benefit there. So what does the perspective literature tell us about this if that's the systematic review? Well, again, if we look at non-shockable rhythms, what we see is there's a large percentage of these patients in this PEA and asystole who actually have cardiac activity. And one of the larger perspective date, uh, trials to date, which has some Canadian centers in it, found that in PEA, up to 55% have some cardiac activity. And it's down as low as 10% for asystole, but I think that's still higher than we ever expected. 
When they follow that through though, to the different time points. So at ROSC, survival of the hospital admission and survival of the hospital discharge, what they see is that cardiac activity on ultrasound actually had the highest odds ratio for success or survival at any given point. And if you compare that, that even holds up to things like length of resuscitation or shockable rhythm per their analysis, which probably means there's some signal there that if you see cardiac activity, there's probably some association with hospital survival. So this is kind of the non-shockable side of the coin that we currently operate on this spectrum. And we see here that there's two extremes. So one end is being this patient with PEA or asystole on the monitor. They don't have a pulse and they have this cardiac standstill on ultrasound. And this is our current understanding of non-shockable rhythms. And our job in resuscitation is somehow to get them across the screen to this, which is the ROSC and perfusing side of the rhythm or spectrum with the pulse and organized cardiac activity on ultrasound. But I think what we're seeing with this evidence is there's probably a middle ground here that we're taking people that we thought were always in this end of the spectrum to try to get them here, but there's likely patients here in this pseudo PEA. So they have either PEA or asystole on the monitor, they don't have a pulse, but they have some cardiac activity on ultrasound. And the question is, we don't know how frequently this actually happens, but is this a different patient population, this one, than this one? I think some of the evidence is pointing at yes. So again, when we look at the pseudo PEA or cardiac activity and a non-shockable rhythm setting, what the evidence tells us is that this happens way more than we expect. Somewhere between 50 and 75% of PEA and somewhere between 10 and 35% of asystole. And again, the question is, does this make a difference in hospital admission? And when you look at these two studies, we see that particularly hospital admission goes up when there's some cardiac activity. And that kind of mirrors the table we were looking at where the odds ratio for survival at ROSC, hospital admission, and hospital discharge seem to be the highest for those with cardiac activity. So there does seem to be some prognostic indicator there. But what if we look at the other side of this coin then, or how good cardiac standstill is in and of itself? And what you may say, that's great enough, we can try to predict who will get ROSC, but can we use ultrasound to predict who won't get ROSC and when to stop resuscitation, which might be even more powerful? And the data we have on this is basically here. And that is what it shows the positive predictive value for non-survival or no ROSC when you have true asystole or true PEA with no cardiac activity approaches 1.0, which is quite accurate. And like I said, that meta-analysis was just somewhere about 2.4% of those with cardiac activity go on to actually get ROSC. So what we're getting at is POCUS may overall be better at identifying those unlikely to survive or achieve ROSC rather than the ones who have cardiac activity and will likely make it to hospital admission. So possibly there's a better role for ending resuscitation rather than continuing it. One final prognostication point I wanna to touch on is the question that comes up often, which is if we have ECG, why do we need ultrasound? Because we've been using ECG for years. And this also has been looked at from that group out East in Canada with 180 of their cardiac arrest patients coming into the hospital. And the question was, if POCUS can help us make a decision on prognostication, does it outperform ECG? And what if we combine the two and use both together? Is there some additional benefit there? And essentially what they see is that if you compare ECG or POCUS alone in the first two columns there, the metrics for POCUS seem to be a better predictor for non-survival than ECG does. And then if you combine those two, you get a slightly incremental benefit in accurately predicting who won't survive. So up to 98.2% sensitive when you have POCUS and standstill and ECG and asystole. So while we've been using ECG for years to make these type of clinical decisions, perhaps there is a role for rolling POCUS in instead, or even possibly combining them for additional benefit in making these prognostication decisions. So with that in mind, we're gonna do one more case here because we've talked a lot about if we see cardiac activity, there seems to be a difference to survival to hospital admission. But what if you're faced with this case? You have a 73 year old male, you're 45 minutes into resuscitation, and you've used epinephrine six milligrams in bolus form, and they're on an infusion at 50 mics per minute. They remain PEA with no palpable pulse, and this is your cardiac ultrasound. What do you do in this case? Why don't we go to uh, Sydney? What would you do with this case here? What are you seeing, and how does that factor into your next steps? So with an I mean, I've been in this kind of situation before, but you, like it obviously you don't have cardiac stand, so you have some 
uh, minimal cardiac activity, but it kind of begs the question of how effective it actually is and in combination with like how long the resuscitation has already gone on for. So, um, I mean, I might look for another way to confirm that, that this isn't really pulse tile flow and maybe throw in like an art line or something and make sure that you don't have any forward flow. But to me with that age, with that length of resuscitation and that activity, it would be hard for me to say to continue. Yeah, I think that's totally accurate. And what I'm getting at is we likely have some group here which is kind of being called non-functional or non-survivable cardiac activity. And I think the more we integrate ultrasound into cardiac arrest, the more we're gonna find these middle grounds where we have this non-functional or non-survivable cardiac activity. And basically what this is, is no matter what we've done, we haven't been able to change this cardiac activity into a perfusing rhythm or ROSC that is compatible with survival, despite 45 minutes of resuscitation, pulling out all the maneuvers. So again, with the survival or the evidence showing about 40% of people with PEA and cardiac activity will survive to hospital admission, there's still that other side of the coin where 60% who have cardiac activity won't survive to hospital admission. So I think we don't necessarily know what to do with this case, but there's still going to be some patients who, unfortunately, despite everything we've done, will, their resuscitation will end with this cardiac activity. And I completely agree with Sydney, maybe confirming uh, that you don't have pulse cell flow in an arterial line is probably the next best step to try to guide your next steps. So again, just to kind of close out this section, we're going to talk about the, we're talking about the spectrum and possibly a new spectrum of non-shockable rhythms in the eMERGE, where we traditionally look at non-shockable rhythms as PEA and asystole with no pulse, and they would all have cardiac standstill and ultrasound. And our job is to bring them to the far side of the screen here, where you have compatible cardiac activity with life and a pulse. But again, we're going to see this middle ground where either A, they start here and we have to get them here, or you're 45 minutes in resuscitation like that last case and you're still stuck here. And in that case, I think this becomes this non-functional or non-survivable cardiac activity. And while it may be uncomfortable making that call based on that ultrasound, if you truly look at the EF there, it's probably one or 2%. So if you've pulled out all your maneuvers to try to get them to that right side of the spectrum, then I don't think we necessarily have much more to offer. So we'll put another time post in and kind of summarize what we talked about. So there's likely a significant difference in survival between PEA and pseudo PEA. And about 2.4% of those without cardiac activity on ultrasound in ACIS and PEA will go on to ROSC. What we're seeing though with the evidence is probably focus is better identifying those unlikely to survive than, than for predicting ROSC itself. And of course, like anything we do with ultrasound and that's the benefit of being at the point of care, is that you must integrate the clinical picture into the findings in this prolonged resuscitation. And the last kind of point there is I think as we do this more and more and we take a look at hearts during the intro arrest setting, we're gonna find this non-functional cardiac activity that we don't necessarily know what to do with if we've tried pulling out all the stops along the way. So let's round this out with some talk about pokes and pulse checks. Um, and obviously, as we all know, ACLS puts this big emphasis on finding a pulse within 10 seconds as a biggest branch and decision point for what steps you're gonna do next. And to identify that pulse, traditionally you hear three things talked about, manual pulse palpation, an echo-based technique, or arterial line. And obviously in a perfect world, transducing a pressure directly within the artery is for the favorable setting. And it's probably gonna be most accurate in most cases. But of course the time, personnel, and equipment to do so isn't always available. So that leaves us with the other two techniques, which are this echo-based technique or manual pulse palpation. Now, obviously anyone in this chat is not gonna come as a surprise to you that manual pulse palpation is a terrible, terribly inaccurate way of assessing a pulse or no pulse. And many studies have proven this time and time again. For example, when they take a look at pediatric populations going from VA ECMO or LVAD, which is a non-pulse cell state to a pulse cell state, they only found about 78% of people could find a pulse at all. And that doesn't necessarily specify how quickly they found it. When they extrapolate this out to adults coming off cardiopulmonary bypass, essentially going from a non-pulsatile state to a pulsatile one, only 15% of uh, participants were able to identify a pulse correctly within 10 seconds. So when we're making an entire call on our next decision steps in terms of resuscitation based on something that may be somewhere between 15 and 75% of people can do accurately determine, that's obviously a problem. So I think 
based on all this evidence, we need a better method than manual pulse palpation for next steps. So what about echo-based pulse techniques? And this attracted a lot of attention when this study came out. And this is actually the one that they referenced in the 2020 AHA guidelines. And this casted a lot of doubt on whether we should be using ultrasound and cardiac arrest at all. And what they found was that if you use POCUS during a pulse check, the mean duration was 23 seconds versus without POCUS was only 13 seconds. And they go on to conclude that yes, there's a double in the length of time when you're using ultrasound to check for a pulse than not. A few important points to point out here, however. Number one, I would be concerned about any generalization from this study when the ACLS guidelines call for a pulse check within 10 seconds, and none of their methods here result in a pulse check within 10 seconds, which is concerning in and of itself. But second, the underpinning question for this whole thing is, can we use cardiac activity to determine if there's a pulse or no pulse, especially after our talk of all this pseudo PEA? And again, if we take a look back at that, and we take a look at these non shockable rhythms, these PEAs and asystoles by definition, which don't have a pulse, we see somewhere between 10 and 55% of these, depending on the rhythm, is gonna have cardiac activity. But again, by definition, don't have a pulse. So what I'm getting at is echo may be prognostic, like we talked about in the last section, but I don't think we can conclusively say, I see cardiac activity on ultrasound, that means there's a pulse, because we know it's kind of a 50-50 coin flip on whether there actually is a pulse with this. So obviously, and I guess the one caveat to point out here is if you take a look and it looks like somebody has a hyperdynamic LV and it's snappy and it looks like compatible with life and you don't feel a pulse, probably worth confirming that there's actually no pulse in that case, because sometimes obviously we can overlook a pulse. But that brings us to this. If we see this, is there a pulse or is there no pulse? And can we use this? Is this accurate? And does just seeing visible pulsation on ultrasound mean anything? And it turns out this has been looked at as well. And as recently as last year in 2020, that patients, again, coming off cardiopulmonary bypass, going from this non-pulsatile state to a pulsatile one. And what they see is just throwing the ultrasound on there, good old 2D ultrasound, has reasonably good sensitivity and specificity for determining whether there's a pulse present or absent. And when you put that into likelihood ratio form, the negative likelihood ratio, or the ability to basically say, I don't see a pulse and therefore there likely is not a pulse is down as low as 0.1, which is enough to affect management. Now, what I'm getting at with the arrow here is in general, as expected, this becomes a little bit less sensitive as you move to lower blood pressures. However, it's worth noting this, this is all compared to arterial line, which is the gold standard. And some people will say, well, the sensitivity and specificity of 90% isn't good enough for me. But it's worth noting again that compared to manual pulse palpation, which is only 50 to 60% specific compared to arterial line, that ultrasound likely outperforms manual pulse, pulse palpation. So what I think I'm getting at is if an arterial line is in situ, fantastic, use that. And if not, then consider ultrasound in those cases. The question then becomes, is this feasible? And a randomized crossover trial in, from the uh, focus group in Toronto has looked at this question and essentially what they, they took away from the study is, A, carotid ultrasound is actually a little bit faster than palpation, and B, there's a higher first pass success rate in terms of finding a pulse. So I think the takeaway is, like all resuscitation, as long as you have a team member ready and uh, willing and able to do that pulse check, whatever method you choose, you're going to have a faster pulse check than having somebody have to do it as soon as you pause compressions. The one last thing I'll talk about with terms of this focus pulse check is this reliability of carotid ultrasound at low blood pressures. Because obviously when we get ROSC, we're often dealing with profoundly hypotensive patients. So again, what they looked at in this study is patients coming off cardiopulmonary bypass. So going from a non pulsatile to a pulsatile state and looking to see if there's a time difference between when they first saw a waveform on radial arterial line versus pulsation on carotid artery ultrasound. And they do see a time difference here. They put it at about 24 seconds between when they first saw the radio arterial waveform and when they first saw carotid pulsatility on ultrasound. But again, the fair question becomes, if it took 24 seconds to see carotid pulsation compared to arterial line, how long would it take manual pulse palpation to do the same? And we don't have that comparison here, but based on all the other evidence we have, probably a lot longer than the 24 seconds. So, We'll signpost pulse and pulse checks here and sum it up as manual pulse palpation and echo-based techniques are unreliable for the reasons we talked about.
Now, looking at large vessels, so femoral or carotid with focus, probably isn't 100% specific compared to arterial line, but likely a superior to manual pulse palpation. And this is something we need more studies to look at. And I think the key, like everything we do in resuscitation, is to have a team member ready at the pulse check, regardless of the method you're using, ready to go to try to minimize that time and interruption of CPR. So we're going to close this out, just talking about a few uh, future directions in focus cardiac arrest. And this likely won't come as a surprise to anyone who's talked to the focus group here at Western, but we're all big proponents of this intra-arrest transesophageal echo. And particularly for those who haven't seen transesophageal echo in general, especially when CPR is ongoing, this is what this typically looks like. And the anatomy here, for those who are, have done any echo on the peristernal long axis, is kind of a flipped over version. So you have your left atrium up here, your mitral valve, your left ventricle is being squished, your right ventricle is this little thing down here that's being squished through the chest, your aortic valve, and aorta. So again, the difference is it's reverse. Instead of your right ventricle being on top, like it is when you look through the chest, it's in the front because you're looking from behind the heart. Now, TEE in itself has its own advantages and disadvantages. Just the, probably the biggest advantage is you can monitor CPR and monitor resuscitation without interfering whatsoever. So you can continue CPR, obviously, as evidenced by that clip, and defibrillate with the probe in without any interference in that. The other thing is there's no more difficult window. So there's no more searching for a window, sub or anything like that, because you're millimeters from the heart. And additionally, you get the added benefit of, again, monitoring CPR where the compressions are going, as well as looking at the aorta. Now, on the other side of the coin, there is some disadvantages. And because you're right close to the heart, you get a heart and aorta view only, but you can't necessarily call pneumothorax yes or no. And you can look at the basal or parts of the lungs. However, you can't see the typical lung sliding we look for in the chest. Obviously, availability of probe and experienced operator is a big barrier because not every center is going to have this. And then esophageal perforation is down as low as 0.03% when this is used appropriately. So these are the two big benefits we talked about in TEE in terms of being non-interfering or resuscitation while providing this information. On screen left, we again see where compressions can be monitored where they're going. And in, in this case, you see that there's accurate place compressions going through the RV, through the LV, and that aortic valve and aorta is open throughout the entire compression cycle. The caveat here again, is we still don't necessarily know whether compressing the LV over the aorta makes an outcome difference. There's some early evidence to say maybe it is the case, and it, but it depends on what mechanism of CPR you believe is working, whether it's that direct LV compression or that intrathoracic pump model. The other big benefit of transesophageal echo is you get that aortic view. So anytime you have aortic dissection on your, uh, as one of your questions, TE can pretty much rapidly answer that question for you in most cases. And here, this is the left atrium, mitral valve, left ventricle, and aorta. You can see a very unfriendly sign here, which is a dissection flap laying in the aorta. So again, not only do we get the superior diagnostic ability by seeing all these structures in high definition, essentially, but you can do also all of this with minimal interference in any CPR or defibrillation attempts. So let's look at potential benefits that TE can have in the emergency setting. And this, again, that small series that describes 33 of their patients undergoing TE for out of hospital cardiac arrest. And what they see is that 97% of their studies, or 32 of the 33, had some change in management, whether that be finding an etiology, guiding where CPR is going, or even finding things like fine ventricular fibrillation. This is the one we talked about earlier, where 12% of their patients had that. And if we just take a step back and look, while TE obviously has diagnostic value, and it, it might not lead us to find an etiology every time, just like we wouldn't expect ultrasound to do that because things like hypoxia and hyperkalemia are still out in the world where there's no way you're gonna diagnose that on ultrasound. But what I'd say is the time we do find an etiology, that's potentially a game changer in the recess room. And at minimum, if we can do all of the stuff we typically do with ultrasound while not interfering in CPR whatsoever and getting higher quality images, then I think that's a win as a whole. And we do have local data as well with our own Drew Thompson and Jake Pace that show not only is TEE feasible, but has incremental benefit over transthoracic echo. So again, things like aortic dissection, non-interference in CPR, and taking a look at where CPR is actually being placed. Like all things, the question then becomes, is this feasible? Can we teach this to emergency physicians and residents? And at least we know for the four basic views which are laid out here, we have evidence that it can be taught. And these four views are kind of referenced as the resuscitation views. So you can get a global view of the LV, 
you can get monitoring of compressions and two left-sided valves, which are significant, and you get an overall view of the heart as you go. And what we know is that an intervention as little as two hours of hands-on simulation time and two hours of workshop, when they tested that pre and post, there is retention of skills there. So right after the workshop, about 82% of the time, the views could be generated. When they take that out to six weeks, up to 96% of the views could be generated. And that might not even be people who used it in the six weeks intervening between these interventions. So certainly not only is it feasible in the emergency department, but has prognostic value, it has diagnostic value, and we can learn it. And I think there's probably gonna be one of the ways of the future. So let's sum up what we've gone through here today, just to close out. So what I would say is POCUS can help diagnose a cause of arrest. So somewhere between 15 and 30% of arrest, we're gonna find something with ultrasound. And of course, when we're making those diagnoses, just be mindful of the caveats we were talking about earlier, particularly that RV dilatation and whether that actually means PE or is this just an intra arrest finding. What we know is about 50% of PEA and 10% of asystole rhythms will have cardiac activity on ultrasound, and they likely have different outcomes than the ones who truly have cardiac standstill on ultrasound. And what ultrasound probably has a benefit of is prognostication in the negative sense in terms of who is unlikely to survive rather than who is likely to survive. There's probably an emerging role for large vessel POCUS visualization to see if there's a pulse there. And that likely outperforms manual pulse palpation. It might not be as good as arterial line, but pretty darn close. And like I said, of course, intra rest EE is probably the future focus direction that at least here we'll work on uh, quite diligently. And with that, I will open up to questions or discussion. Uh, would love to hear people's thoughts on where they're using ultrasound, where they think the future is going to be, and particularly what you do with these patients who have some cardiac activity after 45 minutes of resuscitation. And what do we do with those patients now that we're looking for them? Shane, John. I'll jump in, seeing as I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not... Uh, the best versed in, in POCUS, but uh, you make a very good case, I think, for uh, TEE in intracardiac uh, arrest, uh, TEE. Um, and, and from my perspective, I think the, probably the most important thing you said was actually monitoring the effectiveness of the CPR that you're doing. Because um, I suspect that, uh, well, we all know just uh, uh, from having been in many cardiac arrests that, you know, some patients you get a palpable good pulse with, with, with compressions and other people you really don't. And it may be their anatomy or more likely it's, it's probably actually how we're, we're doing the CPR in those individuals. And there may be lots of factors, but, but I think you make a really good case for that. Um, I think in terms of, for me, the, you know, in terms of diagnostic help, um, I still think the money really is on those patients who have uh, tamponade, uh, who are fairly few and far between, but it's certainly important to pick up. Um, if you could pick that up again with the TEE, you're able to do it without getting, you know, getting in the way or hampering CPR or anything. Um, and I think that's, that's extremely valuable. I think for most operators, it's probably going to be more difficult to pick up other subtle findings that you, you talked about. Um, so perhaps not as useful there for the average practitioner. Um, and finally, when it comes to the issue of predicting the outcome, um, well, actually, there's two, sorry, it's not the final thing. There, there was one other point that I thought was really interesting, and that is the, the issue of how frequently our patients, do they actually have some cardiac activity when we think they're EP, PEA or uh, asystole? And, and there, perhaps, the lesson, particularly in situations where you don't have POCUS, um, is, you know what, maybe we should just go ahead and shock those people anyway. Uh, and I actually had a case just uh, within the last week where the patient what appeared to be an asystole, and then it looked like it might be fine VF. And so we shocked and we actually eventually after 45 minutes got, got a pulse back. Um, uh, in terms of um, the sort of the predicting the, the final outcome, I'm not sure that it really makes a big difference because honestly, if you've you don't have a palpable pulse. You don't have a, 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 a pulse you can detect with POCUS, which again, I think is a great idea. Um, does it really matter that whether the heart is just moving a little bit or 
or not. Uh, I mean, frankly, if you've been going for 45 minutes and they're, you're into your eighth or your 10th dose of epinephrine, um, you know, it's probably time to call it quits. So it's maybe comforting to be able to see that and sort of know for sure, but I don't think it's actually making a big difference there. But great talk, really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. I appreciate it, Dr. Rare. Yeah, I think I think that's going to be the biggest thing is we're going to see this non-functional or non-survivable cardiac activity. That no matter what we else we do, we have no other option. That they're going to have some agonal cardiac activity. That when you pronounce them, that's going to be it. Hi, Shane. Um, the other thing I was thinking about is um, implications for pre-hospital. And for us, when we are on the line with pre-hospital, sometimes it's uh, uncertain as to what's going on and asking for pronouncements. And especially when there's the question of asystole versus PEA, um, your talk number one would give some thought towards the utility of ultrasound and pre-hospital, which is a, is a bigger question, but also for us, um, sometimes potentially have to err on the side of caution with the the topics that you discussed today. Yeah, it would be very interesting. And I know some of this data comes out of Europe where they're quite a bit ahead of us in the pre-hospital world, having like physician-based systems and things like that. Um, but like that, for example, that 100, 100 patients in the CPR group and 100 in the recess group was all pre-hospital patients where they're seeing if they made a change in management. So I think sometime in the future, maybe we'll get there, but uh, it'll be interesting for sure. It'll probably helpful, like you said, when the patch phone. Shane, it's Rob Arnfield. Uh, great talk. Um, obviously dear to my heart. And uh, you know the, the pre-hospital piece, I was speaking, when I came back from fellowship in New York, I remember engaging our pre-hospital leads at that time saying, I was having increasing moral distress about the idea of uh, two different standards of care for CPR and for pronouncement, one in hospital that typically relied on ultrasound and one in the field that the TOR relied on sort of old time hockey techniques. And so um, I, I can only imagine that as you continue to move this along with Frank and the gang downstairs that, you know, that, that distress about that disparity is going to rise. So I think Dawn is uh, onto something there. Um, the other piece I'll say is that even though the search for evidence and for guidelines is there, you know, I, I regard ultrasound in these situations as a navigation system, if nothing else. And sometimes even when you know where you're going, you enjoy having the navigation system engaged in your car. Um, it provides comfort and it provides uh, a sense of, of order in an otherwise chaotic situation. And so I think regardless of what the evidence shows, that's why we keep going back to the well with ultrasound and it's unlikely to become unglued from, from these approaches, no matter what the uh, ill core uh, uh, recommendations show. And your point about the cough CPR was spot on. Awesome. Yeah, thanks a lot. And if we come back to, to Dawn's question again, um, it really does beg the question as to whether or not we should be saying, hmm, just continue CPR and bring the patient to hospital um, or not. Uh, and then one has to factor in, you know, what's the transport time and where are you taking the patient? You know, what sort of capabilities do they have and so on and so forth, particularly when we're talking about doing regional patches. Um, but it's uh, for those cases in London, um, you know, it, uh, Again, it depends, it probably a lot of it depends on how long the arrest has been going on as to whether or not we actually are prepared to call it based on this evidence. Yeah, I think I ended up with more unanswered questions in my own mind uh, after this than maybe answered, so. Awesome, any other questions or thoughts on that? Otherwise I think we can today. That oh, was a great talk, uh, Shane. Thanks for uh, always a supporter of the uh, focus uh, topics and always happy to hear your feedback from the group on the uh, resuscitative and the TVs and stuff like that, especially from our uh, focus group. Awesome. All right. Uh, thanks everyone for joining and listening. Obviously, uh, always happy to field questions offline as well, anytime in the department, text, email, whatever it may be.